I am a geneticist and a biochemist, so I have two doctorates. Um, I used to do research at the university. Uh, I am in Oregon. I don't know where you guys are. We're in Northern California, Redding. Oh, I'm your neighbor. <laughs> so I used to do research <laughs> in uh, gene therapy and stem cells at OHSU. Okay. And since last year, or maybe one and a half years, I started this company called The Scrutinizer. So I, I started this company because there was so much misinformation in the society regarding, um, for example, vaccinations, GMOs, organic foods. So what, do, what does my company do? Uh, I made a one-step information portal. What that means is that anyone, and it is made for uh, lay people, not a scientist. So people can come to just one website and get uh, all the information they need on one topic or any topic. For example, on cancer, they don't have to go to WebMD, Wiki, you know, Mayo and all that stuff and then be confused about all the information they receive. So I wanted to make this one-step information portal. So in a way, what I say is I make and sell the thinking caps. And why do I say that is because I present people with scientific facts and I want everyone to learn critical thinking skills uh, so that you can distinguish between reliable and non-reliable information. And this helps alleviate the misinformation. So, for example, even if I'm saying something and I have creds, but still you should be able to think by yourself and think whether, you know, something is correct or not. So that is my main mission for the <coughs> scrutinizer. And sec the other thing is that we should always follow uh, the science-based information and not evidence-based. And this is one of my most favorite slides that uh, it really, really, uh, you know, explains the difference between science-based and evidence-based information. So science-based usually means that there has to be a solid literature, for example, decades of literature on any topic. But evidence would mean even one occurrence, that would mean evidence. So this slide shows here we have autistic children, they received vaccination. So according to the evidence, because you know it's not always happening, the evidence dictates that uh, vaccination causes autism. Yeah, the autistic children, they're playing with a stuffed toy. So if you're looking at evidence-based information, that means the stuffed toy causes autism. And now this is a cat. We all know it's a cat. It has four legs. There's a horse has four legs. But if we're looking at evidence-based information, then evidence could say that this, in fact, is a cat, not a horse, because it's evidence. There is no... Um, no scientific data to prove it. So this is what the other uh, thing that I really want to impart to people is the difference between the science-based and uh, the evidence-based. So from here, combination of this and the critical thinking skills, you should be able to kind of identify everyday matters that are happening. Okay. Um, we're gonna go into epidemiology. Okay, so what is epidemiology? This is a very broad field. It is the study of disease and health-related conditions in human population, yes. But it includes, it's a study of frequency, it includes distribution and determinants of the disease and other health-related conditions. And secondly, it is, the application of this study is to prevent uh, the disease and promote health. So this, um, so that is the definition we will go with uh, uh, of epidemiology, and we will go from one. Uh, from it, we will cover each step what it said. So the first thing that we said is epidemiology is a study. So it involves, what does, it, what does the study mean? That it involves collection, analysis, and interpretation of the health data. This means epidemiology is a science. The second uh, word that came in our uh, definition was frequency. 
frequency means, as you know, the number of times an event occurs. So epidemiology studies the number of times a disease occurs. So it answers the question, how many? And so this tells us epidemiology is a quantitative science. Okay, so I'm just going to bring the definition again so we can revisit it. So the second part is it's the study of the distribution and determinants. So what does distribution means that uh, so epidemiology will study the distribution, but it means that it is going to answer the question who where and when. So who, which people, where is the distribution, meaning which parts of the country or the globe, when would be when it happened, the date. So this means epidemiology describes, this is how it describes the health events. So determinants, then we said it studies what determinant determines health events. So this, uh, by looking at the determinants, we answer the question or epidemiology answers, say it says how and why. So this means epidemiology analyzes the health events. Okay, so we did this and now we're gonna come to the last two parts of the disease and health related conditions. So epidemiology is, so it, uh, so it does not only study the disease, and the focus is not only the patients, but it studies all health-related conditions. So this means it is a very broad science. Just need to move this. Okay. Okay, so the last thing we said was about human population. So epidemiology diagnoses and treats the communities or the people. So clinical medicine is the one that diagnoses but also treats the patients. So epidemiology meaning, um, you know, you can see the relation between clinical medicine and what epidemiology is uh, defining. So epidemiology is a basic science of public health. And lastly, the application. So epidemiological studies, they have direct, um, they have direct practical applications for the prevention of disease and promotion of health. So epidemiology is a science and practice, and because of that, it is an applied science. Usually we have sciences which are basic sciences, and there are applied sciences, like but the basic sciences would be chemistry, physics, and there would be applied sciences um, going to, um, to, for example, biochemistry or microbiology and so forth. So, but epidemiology covers both. Um, applied and basic science. So what are the aims of epidemiology? The ultimate purpose of epidemiology is to prevent the disease and promote health. And how does this do that? So the first, first, first would be to get the natural history of the disease. Then we describe the health status of the entire population. And then the determinants of the disease would be established. Finally, we would ev evaluate uh, the, uh, the intervention and effectiveness. So basically epidemiology in the end, it becomes more like looking at all these factors and a statistical analysis and reach a conclusion that, okay, if, if so many people were affected at what point, so that the, for example, the CDC, that's how they do the epidemiology and they put plan in action to prevent any of the disease. So yes, so this is, for example, the infection uh, uh, example. So for example, the, in a class size of 20, there were cases of cold infections, okay? So this shows in January, we had one in case of infection. Now in February, the major we can count as one, two, and three, the three arrows that are in here. But then this one going towards March, we could consider that as February. And in March, we have one. So from here, just from these arrows, we can answer a lot of questions. So what is the period prevalence during February? So there were six 
cases out of 20, so 30% kids got cold infection. Then what was the point of prevalence? Point was 5% because there was just one. Because it's asking at 28th of February, which is this. And what is the incidence in February? That would be uh, four, so it's 22.2%. So in epidemiology, this is how you look at the entire data. It involves a lot of statistics, and that's what it is. And then um, there are two major categories of epidemiology. It's descriptive and it's analytic. And in total, epidemiology always answers six questions. When you just talk about epidemiology, and we looked at the definition, so it always answers how many, who, where, when, and then why, and how. So descriptive epidemiology means it defines the frequency and the distribution of disease because we are describing that this was the frequency and how the disease got distributed. Then there is analytic epidemiology. It analyzes the determinants. It analyzes what caused the health problems. And so from analytic, we can answer the questions, how the disease happened and why it happened. From descriptive, we answer the question, how many, meaning the number of people, who they were, where they lived, and when, the time period, like we looked at that slide, uh, the previous slide. Okay, so in epidemiology, the basic, this is called an epidemiological triad, actually, the triangle of host, agent, and environment. So they are related, and this is the most important relationship in studying epidemiology. Host, as we know, it is any organism that would harbor the disease. It may or may not uh, be ill. It may or may not spread the infection. Well, it's a host. It could spread the infection. And then the environment is the external factors. They will allow the transmission of the disease. And the agent would be, for example, the microbes that are going to cause the disease. So all these three things are related together to, to vector. Vector is a person, animal, or anything that is going to carry the disease and it's going to transmit the infectious pathogen. So this is, in a nutshell, the basics of epidemiology. So, um, and then we, so for epidemiology, like I said, it's a very broad field and we have epidemiology of everything. There would be epidemiology of cancer. There would be epidemiology of um, any other diseases. But today's, what the topic was given to me is on infectious diseases, right? And to, uh, and the, and to prevent the disease. So we are only going to address the infectious disease epidemiology. Okay, so the, what does the epidemiologist do? He will, he or she would identify the source of infection, the mode of transmission, the etiology of the disease, and the factor, and then it would determine the future trends in a way to look into the future and then Uh, design prevention and control measures. So for example, these are the disease detectives and they are like this, they are doing that. This is like, look at this, everyone got ill two to three days before school holidays. And so this is how they're going to look at each and every number of people who are getting sick and why. And here, this goes into more detail that, that for example, the one person got sick after the barbecue party and it was a Saturday. So that determines the time also. Okay, so coming to infection. So what is infection? It is the um, entry and development of a disease, right? So entry of an infectious agent it would multiply and then it would cause disease in the body of the man or animals. But entry, uh, but it, the infection may or may not always cause illness. 
because we could have we could harbor the microorganisms and not get sick it all depends on their number and nature and so forth so here i wanted to show just how some of the infections could spread and these diseases spreading via via these modes like there is a direct contact you handshake or by air um, or by indirect contact from food or beverage or anything then we have mosquitoes or of course avian animals so these are called the communicable diseases as well okay i wanted to show the the spread of infection for example so it, it, it more every time uh, any of these infections spread like from a tick or lice so there is a life cycle or malaria there's a life cycle so we have here i'm showing the cat which is a definitive host a definitive host means in which the parasite stays it becomes mature and it passes the sexual stage meaning the eggs are laid out here so if this cat shed the eggs of the parasite then this could go into the as soon as these find a host they will find either they can go back into the definitive host but they will jump into an intermediate host whoever they find so for this one there is a rat an intermediate host means that the parasite is now a, la a larva and it is in asexual state so it's not reproducing but it's a larva and it is going to grow and the last ones for example in this case the humans or the pigs so this these are called the end stage uh intermediate hosts or the transport host so these are the carriers in which the organism remains alive but it does not develop further they do not get sick but they these are gonna the, the transport host is gonna spread the disease to other people so this is how any of the life cycle happens even with malaria for example it bites the people and then it's to it uh well and then it uh, it has its life cycle in the red blood cells and so forth okay um yes so i don't know if you guys have ever heard about typhoid mary mm -hmm. have you guys heard that name yes okay do you know the story i don't okay so this was interesting in 1900s she was irish when she came to the us at the time um the doctors had thought that okay now they had enough experience and they had typhoid under control and she was a cook and she so wherever she cooked food when uh, and if the food was not properly cooked or if maybe if she was preparing sushi so it, the family in the family they they got typhoid and this woman really not intentionally but she spread a lot of typhoid in new york at the time so people could not people could not really understand how that she can carry typhoid but she is spreading the illness and they were not very kind to her but in further uh, i mean she yes they didn't know the answer so she um she did not have really good chance with them but as the science developed further uh the scientists discovered so we have macrophages in our system in the immune system so macrophages are the cells that eat the foreign body so initially when an infection occurs they are aggressive but after a few days after they have eaten all that foreign body things and they become less active and they regress but what happens in some people is that there are leftover typhoid cells they can actually live in the very uh, cells the macrophages which are supposed to kill them so what this means is like this woman mary was carrying typhoid cells so they were in very little quantity so she was not sick she was immune to it and she would spread the infection and um, so she was a carrier of typhoid so going further to the infections what is an epidemic an epidemic would be that there was be uh, excess of disease spread 
all of a sudden over a large area. So, and then endemic, endemic means it is the constant presence of the disease in a given area. It is, endemic is not, uh, for example, it's not in the whole world. Endemic would mean if we got a disease just in the United States. So, but then when the, when the conditions are favorable, then we can burst into an epidemic. So for example, the common cold, typhoid, like we discussed, or hep A. Then there are uh, words like sporadic. Sporadic means rare or in between or it's scattered. So these cases, they occur irregularly. We cannot really, um, we cannot, we cannot really pinpoint them. Um, uh, I, will, I wanted to say statistically, but we cannot really pinpoint them. But according to epidemiology, we would have an idea wherever they can erupt. So, but at once again, they could be the starting point of an epidemic. Anything can become an epidemic if, uh, if the, depending on how many people are affected. So in this case, for example, the polio, tetanus, or meningitis, and so forth, they are, they, uh, they are called the sporadic. Um, infections. Okay, so the pandemic, now that is the worst of anything. Pandemic means that an epidemic that has affected almost the entire world. So there was a bird influenza in 1918 and 1957, or there was cholera. Or, or the conjunctivitis, it happened in uh, 1971 and 81. So those diseases, I mean, are called pandemic, even if it was infection, but it is pandemic. Okay, then we have exotic diseases. Exotic would mean that they would rarely occur in your own um, that they are imported in a way, like we would call an exotic fruit. So, for example, if a rabies is occurring in UK, it is exotic for that kind of Or epidemic of polyarthritis. So, meaning the diseases that are not an indigenous to that country. Okay, so the zoonotic infections, for example, with salmonella, variola, rabies. So these are the infections. They occur from the vertebrate animals to the man. Oh, and so the nosocomial infection would mean that when the patients come to the hospital, they were not they had no infection. This means they got infected in the hospital. For example, the, the picture I'm showing here is, it does say, uh, look at the staff. Staff it here, the, if you look at the spellings, it's staphylococcus. So it's showing you all different st strains of staphylococcus that lurks around in a hospital. So when people go for anything, or especially surgery, the way we say the surgical ward is, is the mine of infections. So here, then the people who get infected in the hospital, those are called the nosocomial infections. Okay, so coming back to epidemiology, we looked at the infection. And so putting epidemiology in summary, so we have, this is in fact a, um, the curve showing about the, how the disease progresses or it can become more and less. So the population and what it involves, there is data collection, then there would be analysis of the data, then we would interpret it like any other scientific experiment, then we would take an action. This is how epidemiology is so very important because it tells us in advance or not, well, in advance from the past facts that how we can prevent future infections and keep the people healthy. So the things that we could do is eradication of all transmission of infection. We can examine the infectious agent and the contaminant and we can just eradicate them. Or we can cure the disease by giving antibiotics and so forth. So I wanted to share the how penicillin was discovered. And usually in science, 
every uh, discovery has been a mistake, meaning the discovery was a mistake, but because the scientists had an open mind and they, were, they could put two things together, so they, we got a discovery. So for penicillium, for example, the Scottish bacteriologist, he was studying Staphylococcus, and he put, uh, put his Petri dish in the open window, and then he just forgets, and then left for a week. When he came back, the Petri dish of his bacteria was growing mold over it, but when he looked at it, the bacteria were dead because it was clearing under the, under the mold. So from there, he, um, he put these things together and we got the discovery of penicillin that it was from the mold and it kills bacteria. So I always ask, when life gives you mold, what do you do? Penicillin. Make penicillin. <laughs> okay. So the other thing when we would discuss the eradication, for example, it's an absolute process. It's an all or none phenomenon, eradication. For example, smallpox or the diseases which we have eradicated or measles or we had, I would say, diphtheria, polio, and so forth. So infectious diseases, we can either... We can prevent them, we can eradicate them, we can and then treat them with antibiotics and so forth. So here I wanted to show this because of all the misinformation regarding vaccination and hopefully it would make sense. So this has been the one in yellow. He's immunocompromised. It, that means he has no immune system, so he cannot receive vaccination. But if everyone else receives vaccination, then he is also protected from major diseases. So this means if you get vaccinated, you're not only protecting yourself and the children, but the people who are unable to be vaccinated. So this was all about infection and epidemiology. Do you guys have questions? How long does it take to become an epidemiologist? How long it takes for an epidemiologist to do what? Education. For your doctorate. Let's for your education. Oh. Oh, I, okay, personally, I'm not an epidemiologist, but an epidemiologist would be, they at least would have a master's. Master's, okay. At, at least, yes, uh, if not doctorate, because mostly they should have. I've studied epidemiology and I studied the, Actually, I devised the method to, um, how do I say? Oh, to, to detect salmonella in the eggs. This was in Germany. So that was my epidemiological study. Salmonella is one of the major uh, organisms that infects the poultry and uh, eggs, as you know. So by the study of epidemiology and drawing all those bar charts, I guess I should say, uh, I devised a method that we could screen the eggs for the presence of salmonella. So I would say that mostly they should have a doctorate, but at least a master's. Thank you. So what is your doctorate in? You have a doctorate in? Biochemistry. Okay, gotcha. So as, do you know if the epidemiologists, do they work in the hospital setting? Or are they only in the lab? Even if it's a hospital setting, there was a slide I was showing that they just sit in front of the computer because they are going to get all the data. It's more like search, a literature search. They are given the, because they, epidemiologist himself is not going to other places and finding the people, the illness and so forth. So anytime an outbreak occurs, they get all this data and they would analyze. So they can be in the hospital setting. Uh, I mean, they do not do bench work, if that's what you're asking. Right, right. Yes, so they, they, would never, well, they would never meet with the, with the patients? No. They would not go out into the field to research the disease? Who would go out into the field? They, yes, but they are not, they have no patient contact. It's not, they're not trained to be... Um, talking to a patient. They're trained to look at all the data that, for example, any outbreak occurred. They would collect the data that what disease was it, what organism was it, uh, how many people were infected, what area 
people was it and from there they would do the statistical analysis and they would come to a conclusion that this has happened then so based on that if it happens again we can put these preventative measures in place so that it does not happen again or you know some more so more of the prevention things or dealing if it really outbreak occurs so that's what an epidemiologist does i think so these guys are all studying they're all 11th and 12th graders thinking of what they can do in the medical field some of them have ideas some of them don't just trying to expose them to some of the things they might not be thinking of most of them are thinking of nurse doctor you know respiratory therapist maybe and probably that's about it right guys okay So you want me to give you ideas or do you want to tell me first who's thinking what? Let's talk about who's thinking what. What are you guys thinking? So yeah, talk, talk to about what you're thinking. What are you thinking? Uh, one says pathologist. We have nurse. Pathologist is very, very important guy. And pathologist would be an MD, usually. If you want to be a real pathologist, you would do an MD. But a pathologist works in the lab. So whenever you have all, whenever you have patients in the hospital, all the samples go to the bath lab. Like at OHSU, we had only one pathologist, so the most important person in that hospital. And any that person is going to... analyze the samples and all and uh, send the reports and so forth so pathology i find very interesting personally because you get to look at all these slides and the bacteria and the viruses and what not anesthesiologist perfect anesthesiologist the uh, although when you look at an anesthesiologist you might think his uh, job is very boring because all he does is you know the thing on the patient's nose so that they keep sleeping but anesthesiologist is the one who dictates the entire surgery because he's the one maintaining the patient in the you know in the state where they are not awake or the pain control and anesthesiologist has a lot of other um, functions these days i mean they can also work for the pain clinic and so forth so anesthesiologist is great pathologist of course the regular degrees like nursing and md and what else yes neonatal neonatal what? yeah so first would okay. be the branches of your md right you do an md the doctor of medicine and then you go into these branches you can uh, be a pediatrician you can be a neonatologist meaning for the newborn babies and they are very very important yes because everyone else kind of i think trains for the the adult medicine uh it's hard job because it's very hard to see all those very very tiny sick babies but it's a great job you'll be doing good do you work with um dermatologists on like any skin diseases or like rare things are you talking about me personally or well, like dermatology wise you like work have you done any research with rare diseases of the skin or anything like that no because i'm a geneticist so dermatology would be uh, again it is interesting field and it's entirely different so basic degree would remain an md and then you do a fellowship and residency in dermatology so then so you do you think it would an epidemiologist study diseases of the skin though epidemiologist like we looked in the first slide epidemiology is about everything epidemiology is about every disease even cancer so even any occurrence of cancer like the cdc has a whole data base where the epidemiologist has put in there saying okay this is the areas these cancers are prevalent so many people and so forth so epidemiologist does every disease okay why is huntington's disease mostly from mother to daughter because it's excellent so it is a genetic disease if you say something is x linked so it's going to go from the x chromosome and that's how it travels like i worked with fanconi anemia and it was an autosomal recessive disease so do you guys know autosomal recessive <coughs> okay. no, like, right so autosomal recessive would mean so like i said recessive genes we have recessive genes and we have dominant genes so autosomal recessive would mean both the parents mom and dad would have one copy of defective gene and so one in four children will get two copies of defective gene and the moment that happens that kid is affected with the genetic disease 
you did you did stem cell therapy yeah so i am a biochemist basically my doctorate thesis was on toxicology of pesticides um and uh, the my, and then i did postdoctoral fellow in genetics so i have an md and that's how i am a geneticist as well okay it's called metachromatic leukodystrophy what about it i'm wondering <laughs> what it is <laughs> he's trying to get you He wants to I get can't know everything, but I do know metachromatic. What is it? Metachromatic what? Leukodystrophy. Leuko, as the name in, uh, indicates. So leukocytes are the white blood cells, and they can get granulated, um, or normally chrom because we have a chromatin protein which is associated with the DNA. Uh huh. So. um they, they would get granulated and that it would be called this disease thank you so so let me just ask this in stem cell therapy um do you know if they have had any advancements with stem cells and the nervous system as far as re- keeping let's just say paralyzed or als patients is it i know do not even start me on that topic <laughs> because um lately what i've seen is so no first of all it's not working it's not working but what bothers me is that all these centers they are doing so called clinical trials they know it's not going to work but they're still doing it for example even for multiple sclerosis there are these trials going on all over the world and uh, i haven't studied the one in the us but the therapy is the same everyone is what they're doing is they are going to do a total body ablation of the patient and total body ablation means every cell is dead it's like every cell i mean so then the 3 days for this patient are very critical because they could die that's when because you have no immune system whatsoever and uh, the other effects you know like puking your guts out and so forth however with the ms they are giving them the stem cells they took from the patient himself and then they give them back so, so they're going to go bad it cannot it cannot work and the problem with a matched donor is that you need a matched donor that would work if they would take stem cells from a matched donor uh, who is, does not have ms and they would infuse the patient with those cells then it would work so right now i don't even know why they do it but there is no way this therapy can work but the for example the therapy i did for bone marrow of uh, fanconi anemia but i had an advantage because when you inject stem cells stem cells have a homing signal what that means is they all run towards bone marrow because this is where they live and when i did it um so when you when you uh, transplant the new stem cells in the body the new stem cells and the ones that are living inside the body they have a fight with each other and usually the the stem cells living there they win because they are already used to the living there and they are multiplying so in my case uh, in my case with fanconi anemia the patients were very very um intolerant to radiation for example i could just give them uh 300 rads which is like an x-ray and then i give them the new stem cells so their old stem cells they have already died and the new ones would engraft so if we can find a selection method then yes the parkinsons and so forth we can really cure it but right now no have you personally discovered like a rare disease i have discovered a rare disease I've discovered a transcription factor. I've not discovered because I don't work on discovery of a disease, I work on treatment of a disease. Oh. But when I was doing this, so a transcription factor is a small chunk of DNA and this one was involved in the uh copper metabolism because I was working with Wilson's disease. So I got to name the transcription factor and put it in the database. but i have done the therapy like i said for stem cells so after all the fields we discussed there is something that nobody has said and that's why i wanted to say wanted to see what 
everyone would say what they want to study. There is very interesting field, but not with that much money, which is called research, <laughs> who I am. <laughs> yeah. Because in research, you don't just have the same day every day. It's every day is new and exciting because, and then you get to use your brain a lot more than I would say just a doctor. Oh. What is the transcription factor that you, that you said? I named it uh, Z-Rap because it was a zinc resistance associated <laughs> protein. So I did not want to name it after me, like other people name their diseases after themselves. And it seems like they are diseases. So I just named it a Z-Rap. Okay. I would say, um, so what you just said was you like your job. It's exciting. It's different every day. Not necessarily for the pay. No. Uh, you do not go into research necessarily for the money because maybe when you become a full professor, but you can go to industry, yes. Then you can make a lot of money. However, there is a difference between industry and academia. The reason I stick in academia is because I like to work for the patient or the people. When you go to industry, if you've noticed, they would only promote the medication where there are a lot of patients so that they can make money. It's all money oriented. But in like new medications to treat drugs, things like that. Yeah. So if, if there, for example, I just met, I went to a conference a couple of days ago and actually it was on cannabis and it is a, a science uh, uh, conference that happened. And this woman had um, a baby who had an orphan disease, meaning she had a brain tumor when she was born. So there are, there is the, the, that kind of disease is so rare, there would be one or two people affected. So no industry was willing to even make a medication, even if that could have helped that baby. Yeah, that makes so sense. In academia, however, if there is not that, I mean, there is good money, you would live comfortably, but it's not like the first day you go, you're making six figures, because the first day you go, you're making grungy, 30k because you would be a postdoctoral fellow but that is exactly like a resident yeah okay but the perks are for example me i have traveled the world because i get invited from everywhere i've, I've lived in japan israel china i've lived everywhere except a couple of places <laughs> Um, I've even been to Nairobi. So those are the perks that because of my good research, all these countries want me to come there and present my talks and they pay for me. Nice, nice. How about the most interesting thing that you have studied? Most interesting, crazy, weird thing? Maybe television worthy. That would be like my everyday life, like every second of the day. Wow, wow. <laughs> That's what I mean. Um, <laughs> or uh, even if I go back to my doctorate thesis, the reason I chose the topic was, so you, you guys know union carbide plant, and that makes pesticides. So in India, there is union carbide plant, of course, and uh, they use the gas methyl isocyanate. So that had leaked. That is called the worst industrial disaster in the history of the world. And the people who were making or using MIC to make the pesticides, they had no clue of this gas. Nobody knew anything. And in, within one night, their, the, the facility, the gas leaked and there were like dense clouds. This is what it, it's it documented. And people died on the spot and they have still um, uh, the mutagenic effects. Uh, so that's where I had taken this up to make an antidote for those people. Um, so that was exciting. Then I, so I would say, like I said, it's like every day almost. So, okay, a couple of the things were, so personally, let me ask you about um, how, do you, do you think, do you have issues with, I don't know, germs? Because of what you study, because of what you study, how do you balance, you know, is it hard to shake people's hands? Is it hard to not wash your hands? No. Okay. In fact, you know more about germs, and uh, I always tell everyone to soap and water, hand washing with soap and water, not using those hand sanitizers so much, because they are the ones that make antibiotic resistant bacteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the only other thing that would be about germs would be maybe that 
I'm going to cook my food more at home and not eat out, but okay. not that much of paranoia. But the handshaking, I have always thought in my head, but I'm German and that's my just nature that I'm going to shake hands. So Yeah, yeah. So there is another thing also lately called prebiotic, but I'll go over probiotic because our stomach, intestine, we have normal microflora in our body that we really, really need. Those are the ones that keep our digestive system healthy. And for example, if we eat yogurt every day, yogurt has probiotics, they, sh- or they should. Uh, um, uh, what do I was going to say? Oh, so lately there with the discovery of microbiome, because of all the DNA profiling we can do, because the microflora from the stomach and intestine are one of the bacteria that we cannot really grow in a petri plate. We have studied a lot of, you know, bacteria and viruses, but because we can grow them and we can characterize them. But each and every person has different quantity of the the microflora, and we cannot just take them out and grow them because they do not grow in the lab. But with the DNA profiles, we are able to see what kind of microflora any one person has. And everybody's microflora is distinct like fingerprint. And lately, with microbiome, um, so this is called the study of microbiome, it is said that the even the person's uh, physique, like the obesity, or if somebody is skinny, that is because of the uh, microflora they have. And there has been research done on twin. Well, there were twins. They did a research, but before that, I'll go into the mouse. So they took a obese mouse and they took a skinny mouse. And um, so they fed. So this is where microbiome it comes in is that so far, the only way we can transfer those microflora is from the stool and the dehydrated stool and they put them in the caps. So when they started giving that microflora to the obese mice, they, both of them were eating the same diet and the obese my, mouse started becoming like the skinny mouse. So this is the importance of uh, probiotics. But lately we have prebiotics. These are like the small fragments of um, carbohydrates. And uh, this is, well, um, it is yet being researched. There's not that many products out there. But what that means is if you take the prebiotic, which is a carbohydrate or a starch little fragment, it is going to generate the microflora in your system. And it's said that maybe that would be a better way to go for a better health. But So but taking the... You mean taking the prebiotic to, to feed what you have or to grow it instead of trying to do a probiotic? Yes, but like I said, it is a very meal yet, so I will not ask anyone to go buy a prebiotic because there are a couple of things out there. But probiotic, if you are in a normal health and if you can eat one yogurt every day, you're covered. You don't really need to go take tabs of probiotics like everyone else. I think this is what I read a study on was the FMT, uh, fecal matter transplant, yes. in the, um, uh, the C. diff patients. In um, red, what? In red, C. diff patients? Yeah, in the C. diff patients. And then the study I read was showing that the same thing what you said in the mouse, mm-hmm. that they were finding that the, the patients who had gotten certain fecal matter, it, they tended to take on some of the traits of the person who they received it from. So if somebody was thin, they might start to gain weight or the opposite. Exactly, like I say, poop is the answer. (laughs) (laughs) It is the answer. It's not just the poop, it's eating other person's poop. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, this is what you just said, fecal matter transplant, and that's what I was just explaining uh, in a different way about a capsule, but yes. That is because we cannot grow those bacteria. That's the thing. Not yet. I thought they were they were trying. That's what I heard last, but they're not We've able been to. Trying forever. We have been trying forever. So, uh, uh, like I said, but they have not been able to grow. But the only reason we know what bacteria now is because of the DNA profiles. Okay, gotcha. So, the, so your DNA is will determine what your um, microbiota is going to be in your gut. No, no. What the DNA I'm talking about is DNA of the microbiota. 
Oh, okay. Gotcha. Because gotcha. we cannot grow them, right? Otherwise, we can take a swab or we can take the stool sample. Yeah. This is how usually you grow your bacteria and you'll put them in a petri plate. But these, most of these bacteria, they don't grow. So we never knew what kind of microflora anyone has. So we did the DNA profile of the microorganisms in the person. Gotcha. So that DNA profile of the organism is like a fingerprint. Like no two people have the same um, microflora. Gotcha. So is it available, do you think, in a pill form now? Or, do, or is it still being administered by only um, endoscopy and colonoscopy? Uh, there is no pill form yet. And I hope not because I hope they can come out with something else. But uh, it's only the transplant yet, yes. And that also, I am assuming it's in very early stages. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Okay. How do you think the prion disease came into humans? The mad cow disease. Mm -hmm. So the way I see it, which I am not being offensive, but I say it's the revenge of the cow, because the farmers did not have to feed the cow's dead cow. Cow is a vegetarian animal. It has four stomachs. So there's a reason it has four stomachs. So the farmers started feeding the cows their own dead cows. So that's how prion is a protein from the brain. And that's how it crossed the border from that animal to humans. So it's all the greed. I mean, they give them hormones, for example. Yeah. However, recently, I, was, I stay away from organic food first personally. I stay away from GMOs or wherever it says GMO free because there is nothing called GMO free. And I even in this conference, I had this company I talked to because they were like, we analyze uh, GMO free food. And I'm like, how do you do it? So they are saying we do genetic testing. Fine, they can do that. But do they have an original profile of rice before it was genetically modified? They don't. We do not have that rice. And the pest resistant rice we made, it is nothing wrong. It only provided more food for the world. These are the misinformations people are spreading so that they can make money off on the other end. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Bye. Okay.